chiseled, polished. Maybe I won't polish it. This poem is addressed specifically to blacks. Those of you who are not of the black persuasion are perfectly <laughs> welcome to eavesdrop. But I am directing it to the blacks in the audience, and I don't see too many of them. Um, all the blacks say hi. <laughs> well, that sounds like more of you than I see. <laughs> <laughs> That's philosophy. <laughs> well, I'm prefacing this poem with a paragraph from Haki Madhubuti's new book. Haki Madhubuti used to be known as Don L. Lee, and he was a very influential, still is a very influential black poet. He said, we have bloods who are so heavy that they are now in their post-black period will tell you that they've been through that black thing that they were black last year or year before that. Can you imagine a white saying he's been through that white thing that he's now in his post-white period? Well, I thought I'd lay that on you before I read this poem. <laughs> Primer for blackness. Blackness is a title, is a preoccupation, is a commitment blacks are to comprehend and in which you are to perceive your glory. The conscious shout of all that is white is it's great to be white. The conscious shout of the slack and black is it's great to be white. Thus all that is white has white strength and yours. The word black has geographic power, pulls everybody in. Blacks here, blacks there, blacks wherever they may be. And remember, you blacks, what they told you. Remember your education. One drop, one drop maketh a brand new black. Oh, mighty drop. And because they have given us kindly so many more of our people, blackness stretches over the land. Blackness, the black of it, the rust red of it, the milk and cream of it, the tan and yellow tan of it, the deep brown, middle brown, high brown of it, the olive and ochre of it, blackness marches on. The huge, the pungent object of our prime outreach is to comprehend, to salute, and to love the fact that we are black, which is our ultimate reality, which is the lone ground from which our meaningful metamorphosis, from which our prosperous staccato grew or individual can rise, rise, you self-shriveled blacks. Begin with gaunt and marvelous concession. You are our costume and our fundamental bone. Rise to all of you, you colored ones, you Negro ones, to those of you who proudly cry, I'm half Indian. To those of you who proudly screech, I've got the blood of George Washington in my veins. To all of you, you proper blacks, you half blacks, you wish I weren't blacks, niggeros and niggerines. To all of you, the banner is black unity, black unity is the banner and the bond. I think I ought to read you at least one. I think I should read you one sonnet, simply because I have written hundreds of sonnets. I don't expect to write another one. It seems to me this is not a sonnet time. 
seems to me this is a wild, raw, ragged, semi-abandoned free verse time. Now, of course, some of my sonnet-making friends say that's all the more reason for using the sonnet form. You can push all that rawness and wildness into the neat little confining box that is the sonnet. And I guess it's a matter of personal decision. Uh, which one shall I read to you? I think I'll read you one in off rhyme called Still Do I Keep My Look, My Identity from a series which I called Gay Chaps at the Bar. Wouldn't call it that today because my meaning would not be understood. I meant Mary. <laughs> After this poem, I shall read you a hair poem and close with a children's poem called Aloneness. Um, this is from a soldier sonnet series. And I wrote it, well, I was busy writing soldier sonnets at the time, and of course, everything that happened to me, I turned into um, a sonnet consideration. And I was looking at my little boy during this period. He was four, very mischievous little boy he was and he was down there on the floor playing. I was gossiping with a friend of mine um, who happened to be the inspiration for the first poem I read you, The Mother. So you can just imagine she had plenty to tell me. And um, I wasn't paying much attention to my son who kept saying, Mama, Mama, turn your face around. Turn your face around. And um, when uh, I did turn my face around, it was uh, uh, with the understanding that I should have done it much earlier because he had trimmed off about three-fourths of the hem of my dress. <laughs> In fact, before I read th that sonnet, if you'll bear with me, I think I'll read a poem that um, was about him. Find it. Ah, here it is. Life for my child is simple and is good. He knows his wish, yes, but that is not all, because I know mine too. And we both want joy of undeep and unabiding things, like kicking over a chair, or throwing blocks out of a window, or tipping over an icebox pan, or snatching down curtains, or fingering an electric outlet, or a journey, or a friend, or an illegal kiss. No, there is more to it than that. It is that he has never been afraid. Rather, he reaches out, and lo, the chair falls with a beautiful crash, and the blocks fall down on the people's heads, and the water comes solution sloppily out across the floor, and so forth. Not that success for him is sure, infallible, but never has he been afraid to reach. His legions are legion, but reaching is his rule. Well, now, this poem, Still Do I Keep My Look, My Identity, <laughs> thank you. I wrote, because as I looked at him, and notice how graceful his contour was, it occurred to me, what is certainly the truth, that every person has his or her own personal art. And I just transferred that onto the battlefield, and I said, every soldier uh, has his personal art. Each body has its art, its precious prescribed pose, that even in passions, droll contortions, waltzes, or push of pain, or when a grief has stabbed, or hatred hacked, is its, and nothing else's. Each body has its pose, no other stop that is irrevocable, 
perpetual, and it's to keep in castle or in shack with rags or robes, real good, nothing or ill. And even in death, a body like no other on any hill or plain or crawling cot or gentle for the lilyless hasty paw having twisted, gagged, and then sweet ceased to bother shows the old personal art, the look, shows what it showed at baseball, what it showed in school. Now the hair poem is called At the Hairdressers. It's not the hair poem that I've got to write that will be a tribute to those sisters, young sisters, old sisters, who have kept their hair natural instead of imitating someone else's hair. I always get in a little trouble with some of my sisters when I say that, but I feel it very strongly, so I just go ahead and say it. This poem, however, is not that kind of poem. It features a certain hairstyle that was very popular when I was quite young, called the upsweep. Now with the upsweep, you got your hair stick straight, also hot comb straight, and brushed it up and forward over your brow in a little cluster of tight, shiny crokinole curls. That's what we call them, crokinole curls. And then you were ready. <laughs> Give me an upsweep, Minnie, with humpteen baby curls. About time I got some glamour. I'll show them girls think they so fly a strutting with they wool a blowing round. Wait till they see my upsweep. That'll drop them back on the ground. Got Madam C.J. Walker first. Got poor old grower next. Ain't none of them worked with me, men. But I ain't vexed. Long hair's out of style anyhow, ain't it? Now it's tied up high with curls. So give me an upsweep, Minnie. I'll show them girls. Uh, I would like to, well, <laughs> thank you. That sound we used to call speaking in dialect, but a lot of us today prefer to say blackening English. And I'd like to read you just a couple of paragraphs from an, from an essay called Take the load off, baby. Psychocultural pressures of the black school child. For the past few years, a controversy has raged over the black child and the treatment or the very existence of a black language. As noted, some people have denied the reality of a black language. Others consider it a dialect, a vernacular, or a language in itself. The way a person resolves this conflict will be reflected in the way he reacts to, or she reacts to, and or teaches black children. Obviously, there will be a difference in mental outlook between the child who is taught that he is wrong every time he opens his mouth, and the child whose language is respected while he is being taught another language. For those who doubt the validity of a black language, black English has evolved its own speech patterns. A few characteristics follow. The possessive S is usually non-existent. Example, my uncle hat refers to the hat of a relative, not a piece of clothing with avuncular tendencies. <laughs> the L phoneme is often dropped, thus making help sound like hip or fool like food. Some vowel sounds are different also. The I often resembles the A in father. The word the is used as another tense, similar to the West African habitual tense. It implies either something that is a consistent occurrence, earnest be going to school, or an emphasized statement, I be's tired. Last, but possibly most important of all, black English forms phrases and concepts that do not transfer clearly to standard English. Take the sentence, the wind is blowing really hard. This sentence says exactly
exactly what it purports to say, no more, no less. Compare that to this sentence. Oh, be doing it out there. <laughs> Although the hawk basically refers to the wind, the sentence implies much more to the black English speaker. It brings forth a picture of cold and wind almost intolerable. Certain other cultural conceptualizations are established through black English. When asking where someone lives, there are two standard replies. I crib over at or I stay at. The latter is important because it shows a sense of the ethereal impermanence that is felt by most black people in this society at one time or another. Wherever you stay at, you may not stay for long. Well, closing. The most important thing to remember in connection with black children and black English is that no one can afford to confuse non-standard English with substandard English. I want to read you. Thank you. Well, I will tell my daughter that you clap for her because she wrote that article. <laughs> There's much more to it. I know I said I'd read just one more poem, but I would like to read a poem that illustrates these ideas. You're not going to invite me back here anymore anyway, so I may as well get in all of my little points while here. And I promise after this one, I, I'll close with aloneness. This poem is called, But He Was Cool, or He Even Stopped for Green Lights by Haki Mahabuti, or as some of you may remember him, Don L. Lee. Now, this is the kind of poem that can be taken into a tavern, because I used to travel around with some of the young poets into taverns where we would recite our poetry. I still do that with some of the people in the in Valgrave Ward's Coombe, a workshop in Chicago. Haki would often lead us in, and he would say, look, folks. We're going to lay some poetry on you. And um, the kind of poetry that taverniers, who are busy drinking and fighting and quarreling, doing things that they consider real business, they haven't come there to deal with poetry, which they ran out of school to escape, is something that is spoken in accents that they will recognize. Uh, the subjects, too, should be re relevant to what they understand of their situation. Here, uh, in this poem, But He Was Cool, or He Even Stopped for Green Lights, the hero is a young black, the kind that you're used to see standing on the street corners, in the big cities especially, wearing a dashiki. Uh, I'll just take it for granted that you people have heard of dashikis. <laughs> One earring, perhaps, a great big blossoming natural, and a little tiki, and just all in all, he was supposed to represent what is truly stony black, but he was often just following the vogue. Haki objected to this hypocrisy. Listen to the black, English blackening sound. Super cool, ultra black. A tan purple had a beautiful shade. He had a double natural that would put the sisters to shame. His dashikis were tailor-made, and his beads were imported seashells from some black country I never heard of. He was triple hip. His tikis were hand-carved out of ivory and came express from the motherland. He would greet you in Swahili, and say goodbye in Yoruba. Ooh, Jim, he be so cool and intelligent. Cool, cool is so cool, he was uncool by other niggers. Cool, 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 ultra cool, bop cool, icebox cool, so cool, cold, cool. His wine didn't have to be cool. Him was air conditioned cool. <laughs> Cool, cool, real cool, made me cool. Now ain't that cool? Cool, cool, so cool, him nicknamed Refrigerator. Cool, cool, so cool. He didn't know after Detroit, Newark, Chicago, and so forth, we had to hip cool, cool, real cool, super cool. That to be black 
is to be very hot. Well, now the, the people there would say, right on, brother. <laughs> <laughs> whereas, whereas they would not have said it for one of the excellent poems of um, William Butler Yeats, John Donne, Wallace Stevens. A poet is very fortunate when he or she has children because they're always giving you material from which to distill. And when my daughter was 13, she said to me, I like aloneness, but I don't like loneliness. Aloneness is different from loneliness. Aloneness is different from loneliness. Loneliness means you want somebody. Loneliness means you have not planned to stand somewhere with other people done. Loneliness never has a bright color. Perhaps it is gray. Loneliness does not have a lovely sound. It has an underbuzz. Or it does not have a sound. When it does not have a sound, I like it least of all. But aloneness is delicious. Sometimes aloneness is delicious. Once in a while, aloneness is delicious. Almost like a red, small apple that is cold. An apple that is small and sweet and round and cold and for just you. Or like loving a pond in summer, there is the soft water looking a little silver dark and kind. You lean most carefully and you wipe the single pick there. Rest is under your eyes and above your eyes and your brain stops its wrinkles and is peaceful as a windless pond. You make presents to yourself, presents of clouds and sunshine and the dandelions that are there. Aloneness is like that sometimes. Sometimes I think it is not possible to be alone. You are with you, and pulse and nature keep you company. The little minutes are there, building into hours, the minutes that are the bricks of days and years. I know another aloneness. Within it, there is someone, someone to ask and tell, one who is Mary, Willie, John, or James or Joan, whose other name is love. I think that's a nice word to end on. A nice distillation of love. Thank you very much.